You can find them in the soil in your backyard. But they're so tiny, you will need a microscope to see them well. C. elegans is a very small, about a millimeter long, nematode, it's a roundworm, uh, that you can isolate from a compost heap. Uh, and they consume bacteria there, and they're all around us. Uh, they're members of a very large phylum, has you know, hundreds of thousands of species, called nematoda. C. elegans is one of the simplest kinds of animals known to man. But in reality, it's not very simple at all. We call it simple because we happen to be a lot bigger, but 100 million base pairs of DNA is not simple. In 2002, three scientists were awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine for their work unraveling the mystery of how C. elegans develops. One of those scientists, John Solston, meticulously documented the building of the worm from its first cell division to the final adult form. Solston's research opened an extraordinary window into the cellular processes required to construct even a relatively simple animal. For the first time in the history of biology, we were able to see and track the development of an animal from one cell to the adult. It had never been done before. So really for the first time, biology was able to say, here's how you build an animal via development. Uh, you know, uh, that kind of knowledge is very precious. T to have that and to have that in the detail, the in right down to the level of individual cells, that's incredible. That's definitely worthy of a Nobel Prize. Like nearly all animals, the process of building C. elegans starts with a single fertilized egg cell. That single cell divides into two. Those two cells divide into four, which divide into eight, which divide into 16, and so on until there are around 1,000 cells. But the final cells in an adult C. elegans are not the same as the first cell from which they all descended. As these cells divide, they specialize. So you begin with a single cell, the egg, the fertilized egg, that has all the information for all the other cells. And as that starting point divides, the two daughters that it produces asymmetrically don't have the same capacity. In other words, they've already, at that first cell division, down-regulated some of their genes respectively so that this daughter is going to give rise to a whole bunch of different cells that will do particular jobs. This daughter cell will give rise, for instance, to the germline, ultimately the cells that will become the eggs and sperm for the next generation. So you see right from the start, specialization beginning, and then, of course, these two daughters divide and give rise to four. The same thing happens. Those four cells now are expressing only part of their genes with respect to the other three. So you see a process of continuing differentiation where each time the cell divides, it's changing what genes it's going to express so that ultimately as you work your way down through the whole lineage to the tips, this cell here, let's say, at cell division 8 in that particular lineage, will only be doing a digestive task. Whereas one of its cousins, maybe over here on this lineage, will be a nerve cell. Now, those cells will still have all the DNA that they had at the beginning, but most of their DNA will be shut down and not expressed. They'll only be expressing the genes and proteins that they need for their particular job, which to me is absolutely remarkable. You see a decision tree, a, sort of like a logical switching pattern, where you begin with you know, your starting point, you've got all the information there, and then that information is subdivided in various ways, parceled out along different lineages, where this group, let's say, is going to be muscles. That's the role that those terminal cells will be playing. This group over here will be only the intestine. This group on this side will be the germ cells, the eggs and sperm and so forth. Uh, and there must be some governing logic, some control system that tells those lineages what they're going to do as they are specializing. Uh, and I think 
From the perspective of, of an undirected process like natural selection or evolution generally, it's very hard to see how you could build that without knowing where you were going. So right from the start, there's a decision being made. This daughter cell is gonna give rise to a, a completely different set of cells than this one. So you're, you're making a decision at that initial point with respect not to these daughters really, but with respect to what they're going to give rise to way down in the lineage. That's a, a logic control problem. That's an engineering problem. That's where you, you say, you know, we're going somewhere. This isn't just cancer where you have willy-nilly cells reproducing themselves and, you know, out of control multiplication. No, you have a controlled process of increasing specialization where the first decision is being made with respect to its ultimate target. It defies imagination to conceive of any kind of cause that can do that without knowing where the target is. You've got to know where you're going. The developmental process of C. elegans poses a mystery for modern Darwinian theory and its undirected mechanism of natural selection. The successful creation of a live C. elegans requires many intermediate cell divisions. Yet the temporary cells created by these intermediate cell divisions play no functional role in the adult worm whatsoever. Instead, they merely serve as stepping stones in a long journey that will eventually reach a functional organism at its conclusion. But natural selection can't select a future function. It can only select features that are advantageous already. If something's going to function in natural selection, it's got to function now, at this particular moment in time. Not five minutes from now, half an hour, a week, a thousand years. So a process that lacks foresight, in principle, cannot build a unfolding trajectory, an unfolding lineage, where you need to know the target. That's the fundamental difficulty for any undirected process of evolution. What natural selection and other undirected natural mechanisms cannot achieve, intelligent agents can. Intelligent agents are able to foresee distant functional goals. Intelligent agents can coordinate and choreograph the assembly of many separately necessary parts to achieve a functional end. When I look at animal development, I see a trajectory. It's, in a sense, the quintessential end-directed or teleological process in nature. You're pulling back that bowstring, and you've got a target over there 50 yards away, and you want to put that arrow right in the middle of that target. You need to know what you're aiming at and why, and for that you need a mind. The case for design could not have been made more explicit. I mean, of course, the there are much more complicated developmental pathways in nature. A human baby, over the nine months that it takes to build one, that's something that if we ever come to understand it will really take our breath away. But even these little worms, a millimeter long, sort of humble little creatures out there in the compost heap, they carry the signal of design unmistakably.